I tell you what I really enjoy, and I'm sure that you guys do too. I really enjoy authentic worship. Real worship. As we were entering into the 2020 calendar year, the Lord spoke three things to my heart. I shared it with our congregation every Sunday for weeks and weeks and weeks um, of what that year would look like. What I did not realize was that the things that he was speaking were not just for 2020, but they were for the remainder of this age. There were three specific things he said to me. One of them that stood out to me this morning as I was thinking about it was that we were entering into a place of intimate times of worship. Y'all here on the back rows? Okay, one of you. Y'all here on the back row? Here's what I mean by intimate times of worship. It don't matter if you got lights or not. Y'all here? They're neither right nor wrong. It doesn't matter if you got a fog machine. That's neither right nor wrong. It doesn't matter if you've got 114 channels on your board or if you got four. None of that is right or wrong. Intimacy can happen in a room of five people or a room of 5,000. It's about our heart. Y'all remember that song? I think it's from the 90s. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. Because it's all about you. It's all about you. We are in a all about God moment. Hear me this morning. Please hear me. We are in an all about God moment. My message today, we'll either get to or we won't in just a minute. He's enough. We're in a moment in time where God has stripped away so much and he's asking us to lay down everything else to where we come to this point of culmination where we are desperate for God. Desperate. As the deer panteth for the water, your Bible said, so my soul longeth after you. We're in a moment of history as we've moved to at breakneck speed towards the end of this age and the ushering in of the return of the Lord Jesus and a millennial reign that we've all been prepped for and an eternity with heaven. It's right here knocking at the door. And so we've got to determine in our hearts. Am I okay this morning? I didn't come here to entertain you. I love you, but I didn't come here to entertain you. And I'm going to be straight up honest with you. I don't care how you feel about me when I leave here. The pastor of this church, Bishop Larry J. Raglan, is one of my very best friends. And he's not entrusted me to come in here and tell you something that's going to make you feel good for five minutes. He's entrusted me to come in here and share whatever God has put on my heart. And we way past the 30-minute canned sermons. We way past the sermon, to the service time got to go from this time to that moment and, and this person got to come up for three minutes and this person for two. We are way past all of that nonsense. We are at a place of just sitting in the presence of God and I don't care how long the pastor, the minister, the, the teacher, the apostle, the prophet has prepared maybe days, maybe weeks, maybe months. If God wants to go another direction, then we instantly and immediately go a different direction. Because what we need to hear right now more than anything else is a right now word, not from a man, but from God. What are you saying, Lord? What are you doing, Lord? How would you have me respond, Lord? You came down to the altar this morning. Somebody was walking down here with you, and I don't know what your situation is or what you were coming to Charlotte, right? I don't know what you were coming down for, but you got about right here, and I was standing over here with some friends, and, and, and I just felt the Holy Spirit say, I'm going to meet her right there. Yeah, he did. Amen. 
And, and before anybody even gathered around you, started praying for you, the Lord started showing things. And, and can I tell you this morning, the Lord didn't show me anything because I'm special. Yes, sir. Amen, brother. <laughs> so, some of you have known me for a while, should have said, that's right, he ain't nothing special. <laughs> if you'll look, he'll show you. Yeah. Are y'all here? Yeah. Call unto me, he told Jeremiah, that's right. and I'll answer you. King James said, I'll show you great and mighty things that you know if not. Another translation says this, I'll tell you secret things. Man tells you secrets because they want to gossip. When God tells you secrets, man, you stop, you be still, you open your ears and you listen to what he's saying. As you're standing there, the Holy Spirit said, I'm doing a total restoration and reconciliation it goes beyond the physical healing it goes to the very deepest place of hurt the very deepest place of lack the very deepest place of longing and need and I'm going past that I'm healing the body on the way but I am healing her heart amen amen I need somebody to do me a favor everybody okay this morning Look, we won't go that long. I'm not, I'm not that long a guy, but we're just going to roll with it if everybody's cool with that. I need somebody to bring me a trash can up here. <laughs> a building full of trash cans. He's enough. Somebody say he's enough. Yeah. Hey, Amen. Wasn't it great to see that video? Yeah. I thought, man, Bishop Larry looks really good for somebody who's been on a mission trip for eight days. He didn't even look tired. He must have got a really good night's sleep the night before because I know the rest of the week wasn't like that. Hey Amen. We hosted Ronald C. and, and uh, Pastor Brad and Haley and Mason from the meadow the Sunday before the team left and laid hands on them, prayed over them, spoke into their lives. God did all kind of things. We had people from refuge that fasted all week long during the course of the trip praying for this team. But we're in this thing together, man. Right. It doesn't matter. It's Solid Rock Church, Refuge, Meadow, whatever church. It, you know, praise God for the individual churches and individual ministries and, and personalities. But we are the church. Yeah. We belong to one another yeah. in the same way that we belong to him. Here's what I want to do this morning. We're kind of all over the place because that's kind of how the Lord is. <laughs> he speaks to us and moves us. And I shouldn't say that's how he is. That's how we respond. There's a trash can sitting here. Anybody wondering why? During worship this morning, I I really felt this strongly on my heart that there are some folks. This is for believers. This is for Christ followers. This is for those who have responded to to the convicting of the Holy Spirit and have surrendered your heart and life to him totally and have entered into a relationship with him. If that's not you this morning, then I want to encourage you, as the Spirit of God is drawing you, just go ahead and yield. Because I'm going to be straight up with you. You're probably going to yield at some point anyway. Might as well go ahead and yield now. And understand that it, it, you're in a place this morning if, uh, if you make that decision today to just throw your hands up in there and surrender everything to him, that there are so many people that would celebrate along with you Love you, pray with you, encourage you. So if you're sitting in this place and that's you, I'm, just, I'm not asking you to come down front, raise your hand, any of that stuff. I'm just telling you, man, stop fighting. Stop fighting because what is it you're fighting for? Huh? What's your enemy ever done for you? Has he healed you? Has he provided for you? He saved your marriage? He make them treat you right at work. Your enemy's never done anything for you except to try to destroy you. You owe no allegiance to him. So as you're being drawn by the Holy Spirit, I encourage you just to yield. Your life will change in a way that you can never possibly imagine. The trash can is here for a reason. Sometimes we need point of contact. Sometimes we need... um, Object lessons, sometimes we need types and shadows as we were worshiping this morning. I felt like the Lord said there are a lot of believers in this room that, um, that are ready to go forward, that are ready to, to go to that place of absolute intimacy, that's ready to shout and declare that, God, you are indeed enough, that's ready to put everything else behind and focus on what really matters at this moment. But... 
there's some baggage or some things that, that tend to, that, that are trying to hold us back. Am I communicating with anybody this morning? Here's the thing about your past. Here's the thing about your baggage. It can only affect you to the degree that you allow it to affect you. See, Satan has no authority over a believer. None. The Apostle Paul said, he's no longer got dominion over me. Over any of us. So the truth, the, the only place that he has in our life is what we continue to allow him to have. Now, I'm going to be real. Everybody okay with real? You ever heard the word stronghold? There are some things that set up in your life that become a stronghold, and they're called strongholds because they have a strong hold. I would like to tell you that every single thing that the Holy Spirit has ever revealed to me that we needed to deal with, that needed to be out of my life, that I instantaneously fell on the ground, threw my arms up, surrender, laid it down at the altar of God, and never picked it up again. But if I told you that, I'd be lying. I've been doing this a long time, man. I can't tell you how many times I've cried out to God or hollered out or in anger or frustration or shame or whatever and said, God, why am I still struggling with the same old thing over and over and over and over? I don't want this. I don't want to be this. I don't want to do this. God knows your heart. And so guess what? He already knows that we don't want to do it. That we don't want to be it. But sometimes we reach a place where we need to, we need to take action. You know, faith is an action word. Faith is a verb. Faith is not only what you state with your mouth, but it's the corresponding action that you follow through with. And so there's a trash can here. Now some of you may think this is silly. I honestly don't care. <laughs> I mean it from a good heart. You guys, I'm, I'm a nice guy. I love everybody here. But, but I just really don't care. Because there are a handful of people this morning who need to stand up from where you are, walk down here, pretend that that garbage that's holding you back is in your pocket or on your back or on your head or wherever. Peel that stuff off. Take this stuff of water off. Throw it in that trash can and go sit down. Amen. Amen. Come on. Trash can is open. I don't need your confession. Uh, I don't need any of that. Just come throw the garbage in the garbage. <laughs> I'd have got it for you, bro. <laughs> there you go. Backpack. Yeah. This is the Jesus trash can, so it don't matter if you fill it up. It just keeps taking more and taking more and taking more. Now, if you got up and did that, let's be honest with me. Don't you feel a certain amount of relief? Yeah. And didn't you feel a certain amount of release when that happened? Right. See, God knows who we are. He knows where we're living. He knows our situation. Yep. So I want to tell you this morning, he's enough. Yeah. I was going to sing for you. Uh, well, you know, I've had COVID all week. I don't have much of a voice, so. I was going to sing for you. My friend and mentor, Charlie Kane from Hartsville, Alabama. He's recorded multiple albums through the years. How I many of you listen to Christian radio? Y'all might know his kids, Kane, the man Kane. That's, those are his, his two daughters and his son. But Charlie is my mentor. I learned more from him in two years than I think I have in 
in any two-year stretch of my life. And he had a lot of songs. He had songs of faith declarations and songs of power. And so, but then he had this song called He's Enough. Here's the words, some of the words to that song. Y'all ready? It starts out this way. Waves are lapping up outside your door. And you don't think you can take it anymore. Your world, once so in line, is now just a remnant left behind. All methods of assurance seem to fail. Let me just stop right there. We thought we had everything so in line, didn't we? We thought we had this thing figured out, man. Man, my job's going good. My kids are doing right. My wife's doing good. My husband's doing good. I'm going to church, man. We got it. I, I, I'm here. I'm there. I'm working. I'm serving. I'm doing this thing. We thought we had everything figured out. Our world was so in line. Now just a remnant left behind. That remnant sitting in here this morning. All methods of assurance seem to fail. Everything that we once trusted in, we can no longer trust in. And those things have proven themselves to be unfaithful and untrustworthy. And I, I actually got in trouble a couple weeks ago for some things that I said in my own church. But I'm going to go ahead and say some things this morning because Pastor Sandy opened the door for it. There is nothing in this world system that can provide any of us with any answers, any hope, any future. And we currently live in a world that is intentionally trying to take those things away from you. So do we pray for our nation? Absolutely. Do we pray for this world? Absolutely. Do we speak the word of God over? Absolutely. But I'm not going to spend too much of my time getting involved in these petty, mundane things that on their best day are not going to help me at all and are not going to advance God's kingdom. I'm just going to go ahead and declare he is enough. I don't need a Republican Congress. I don't need a Democratic president. I don't need an independent senator. I don't need any of those things because that was never God's system. That was man's system. I've already got a king and I've already bowed my knee to him and I'm going to serve him and I'm going to be a part of his kingdom because his kingdom's ways and this kingdom's ways do not line up. He's enough. The song goes on to say, when your dreams are shattered and they crumble to the floor and the going on the narrow way is tough and all that you have left is the Lord. He's enough. He's all you'll ever need. He's enough. There's a narrow way that we're called to walk in. Why is it tough? Because it's narrow. How many ever been at a, ven a large venue, sporting event, concert? You're just moving like a herd of cows. Then you get to a door. Now, if it's a big open air thing, the doors are spread. Man, everything's good. good. But, but, but you're trying to narrow 10,000 people into a door that four can fit through. Yeah. And it bottles up. And you got to be patient. Are you listening to me this morning? You got to be patient. No, nobody likes patience. That's right. Or if you do like being patient, come pray for us later. But you're going to get through the door. This is for somebody this morning. And you're going to walk through it exactly when you're supposed to walk through it. 
Don't go looking for a larger opening somewhere else because your destiny is the narrow way. There is a way that is broad and it leads to destruction. But there's a narrow gate and your Bible declares few will go through it. Hurts my heart when I think of that. I want everybody to go through it. But as we look towards him and we trust in him and declare he is enough. Not God and my job, but he is enough. Not God and my money, but he is enough. Not God and and, and my social standing. No, he is enough. Not God and anything else. Just God alone is enough. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. I'm reading out of the NIV. You can follow along on the screen, whatever translation you have in your Bible, your app, or your phone. God is enough. Our Bible refers to him. One of the many names of God is El Shaddai. The all-sufficient one. The God of more than enough. Matthew chapter 6, starting verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life. How many of you have been worrying this this week? Don't raise your hand. Just think about it. Don't worry about what you'll eat or drink. Y'all okay today? Oh, my God, gas is $5 a gallon. How am I going to pump it? Same way you pumped it when it was $1.70. By faith. Oh, what did we think? We were doing it on our own? (laughs) Gas wasn't really high. Groceries weren't very high. Stuff wasn't very high. I'm able to handle this on my own. How do you think you got your job? How do you think you keep your health? (laughs) How am I going to buy groceries? Same way you did before. And this is going to shock you. Can I say this? If I said this in the Word of Faith church this morning, I'd be excommunicated. (laughs) You may find at times that you don't have quite as much as you wish you had. And and here's an incredible thing. I'm going to shock you with this. Then then just do with less. (laughs) Come on. Come on. Yes, sir. My God, did you just say that in an American church? Do it less? Come on. What? Come on. The Apostle Paul, you've ever heard of him? Yeah. Wrote two thirds of the New Testament. Really, he didn't. Everybody understand the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible. The Bible has many, many secretaries, but only one author. But the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to the Apostle Paul moved on him to write two-thirds of the New Testament. The Apostle Paul who planted churches all over the the known world. The Apostle Paul who was one of the most mightiest people of God that have ever walked on the face of the earth said this. I've been abased. Let me know what that word means. It means you didn't have anything. Anybody ever been there? And I've been abounding. I've had more than enough. And I've had not enough. I had situations where everybody that was rolling with me was getting getting paid. Everybody was eating. Everybody was having a good time. And I had situations where I wondered where my next meal would come from. Anybody else had both of those? Here's what Paul said. I've learned how do you learn? Listening, teaching, training, experience. I've learned in whatever situation I find myself abundance or lack to be content. Why can't I be content? Because after all, Kevin, if I ain't driving the newest car and driving and wearing the fanciest clothes, my friend's going to judge me because God ain't blessing you. Mm. 
I mean, if you got to go so far into debt up into your eyeballs to present an image that God is blessing you, you don't understand God. I spent seven days in the bed, didn't get up till Friday, and the only reason I got up is because my wife and youngest daughter were in a car accident. My wife spent six hours in the ER. They took x-rays of every part of her body imaginable. She's one giant bruise. Woke up this morning with COVID. It's okay that I'm here because I just came off of seven days of it. Yeah. Last week, I worked more hours at my part-time job than I ever did. And I'm like, man, I'm going to be loaded. This past week, I didn't work a single hour because I couldn't get out of the bed. <laughs> spent two days with a fever undercover shivering. Do you know that there are certain places that I couldn't even say that today? Because they condemn me that I didn't have enough faith or that I'm not building people's faith. No, I'm building your faith by telling you whatever situation you find yourself in, he is enough. We're here today, aren't we? Don't worry about your life, what you eat or drink, or, or, or about your body, what you wear. Is life not more than food? And your body more than clothes? Man, I'm so hot. Y'all mind? I got a shirt on. Y'all can edit this later. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can anyone in this room by worrying add a single hour to your life? Why would you worry about clothes? Look at the flowers of the field, how they grow. They don't labor and they don't spin. It, yet even Solomon in all his splendor was not dressed like these. Thank you, brother. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown in the fire, how will he not much more clothe you you have little faith, so don't worry. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? How shall we pay the bills? How shall we put gas in our car? Those are earthly distractions spun by an enemy who seeks to distract sons and daughters of God. Because ultimately, if I'm completely relying on God, it is not my responsibility to provide any of these things. We all here? If I'm completely relying on Him, it is His responsibility. And my Bible over in 2 Timothy says, even when I don't abide, even when I don't remain, even when I'm not faithful, He remains faithful because... He cannot deny himself. Faithful is who he is. Your Bible says he's got a name written on his thigh. Faithful and true. Come on. He's enough. I don't need anything else. We don't need the accolades of man. We don't need the prom empty promises of a broken government. He's enough. Somewhere I read, I believe it was in Isaiah, that said, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. He's enough. And if he's El Shaddai, if he's more than enough, if he's all sufficient, then that means that you and I are complete in him. Where my friend at? Oh, God. There you are. How are you? I apologize. I don't remember your name. What is it? Jennifer. Jennifer, thank you. As soon as you said it, I remember it. You were standing right here. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what you're doing. Worshiping, praying, singing, whatever. And you and I, we've talked before, and you've, you've come on Wednesday nights when I've talked, and my wife and I, we've talked to you. But as you were standing there worshiping, I felt like the Lord just told me to tell you that you don't need the validation of all those people you're seeking to validate you. God has already stamped you with his seal of approval. Yes. 
Matter of fact, one of the things that the Bible says about the Holy Spirit, it calls him earnest. How many of you have ever bought a house? Back in the early 90s when I bought one, I wrote a check for $500, handing it to the realtor. It's called earnest money. That $500 says that I'm serious about this process because as long as everything works the way it's supposed to work, if you back out of the deal, you lose your $500. So it's not a lot of money. We were buying a house that cost $86,500. Today, that same house by $350,000. $86,500, Buck, I wrote them a check for $500, to, and they called it earnest money. It was a deposit. It was my proof that I intended to finish out the deal. The Bible says of the Holy Spirit that he is earnest. <laughs> He is a deposit of God in you speaking to us that he intends to finish the deal. That he intends to follow out the process. The Holy Spirit is alive inside of us now today in this earth and this time and this realm. But that's not God's best. God's best is that eventually we will stand in his very presence and we will live all eternity in a new body with a new name with no sickness, no disease, no crying, no lack, no famine. Nothing but perfection serving and worshiping a holy God whom every single day for eternity will see something different about him. You know those creatures that circle the, the throne, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Many years ago, my wife said the Lord spoke to her during a time of prayer and, and said the reason that, that every time they go around, the reason that they say holy, 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 is because each time they go around, they see something different about God. There ain't no point in this life trying to figure God out because your peanut brain ain't going to do it. Just trust that he is enough. And so we are complete in him. Are y'all here? I don't need the validation of man. I've got the seal of approval from God. I didn't deserve it and didn't do anything to get it, but he just went on and gave it to me anyway. I'm not righteous because I'm righteous because I ain't. I'm righteous because he is. I'm not holy because I'm naturally holy. I'm from Chickasaw County, Mississippi. Ain't nothing holy there. We're holy because he's holy. We're not complete because of our own abilities. We're complete because he made us complete. He spoke prosperity over shalom, meaning nothing missing, nothing broken, everything in place. You are complete in him. You don't need anything else. For in Christ, Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 says, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. In other words, when people looked at the man Jesus, they saw the totality of God in a bodily form. <clears throat> Moses said, God, I want to see your glory. And God said, you can't. You'll melt. <clears throat> but God hit him, in the, hit him in the cleft of the rock and covered him and passed by him and, and then removed his hand. And the Bible says that Moses was able to see the passing of the backside of the glory of God and it changed him not just internally but externally and yet John chapter 1 says this that, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the father full of both grace and truth here's the deal God's glory resided with man God wrapped it in skin so it wouldn't melt us but the, Jesus was the fullness of everything that God is in a bodily form. And in him, you have been brought to fullness. If he's fullness, you've been brought to fullness. If he's complete, you've been made complete. If he's whole, you're whole. If he's righteous, you're righteous. If he's alive, you're alive. Because he's enough. We've been buried with him in baptism, it goes on to say. 
We were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in your uncircumcision of flesh, God made you alive. He forgave all of our sin. He canceled all of our debt. Anything that stood against us, he did away with. He's taken it away and he nailed it to the cross. He disarmed the powers and the authorities and he made a public show of them, triumphing over them by the cross. He's enough and you are complete in him. That's why this world has nothing to offer you. Listen to me, man. I know what you're thinking. Brother, that sounds good, but I'm going to get out of here and I'm going to. I know. I am also a human being. What I'm telling you today is God's done his part and continues to do his part. What is our part? Let me tell you what our friend, let me scroll down here. If I need to stop at any point, y'all just tell me stop, okay? Here's what our friend Miles Rutherford said this week. We, it's all of us, do not awaken ourselves. We do not raise ourselves from the dead. Even Jesus needed the Spirit of God to raise him up. We cannot do that, nor is it our responsibility. Please listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying. Our responsibility is our response. We don't wake ourselves up. Our responsibility is once we've been woken up, get up. We're part of this end time remnant church. The remnant is rising. And so what the remnant has to do is respond to everything that God's already done by getting up, standing up, rising up, and speaking up. We are complete in Him. I went, not this past Tuesday, two weeks ago, Birmingham Jefferson Civic Center. If you haven't been yet, it's pretty cool now. It's remodeled. Maverick City, Kirk Franklin, a few others were there. First of all, if you're old school like me, it was really fun to see Kirk Franklin. He got more energy than I do, by the way. Maverick City, are you familiar with him? Throughout the years, there have been a lot of, a lot of um, worship movements if you will, back before my day, uh, maybe the early, my early life, I wasn't aware of it at the time. There was a move, started on the West Coast, the vineyard, vineyard music, changed the face of Christian music forever. Hosanna Integrity came along, Hill Song, I remember when Hill Songs first came around, Shout to the Lord, you remember that? It's like, it was our anthem for a while. But, man, I love these Maverick City folks, man. It's a conglomeration from people from different areas, different churches, different, different races, different backgrounds. And, man, it looks like heaven when they're performing on stage. And it was the closest thing to, to an actual worship service that I've ever experienced in that size of a venue with that type of, of event. But if you know Maverick City, they have a song called Gyro. We sing it at our church. Y'all may sing it here. It says this, Jaira, you're enough. Jaira, you are enough. I heard somebody singing it over here. I will be content in every circumstance. Jaira, you are enough. He's forever enough, always enough, always more than enough. And then it says this about you and I. We're already loved. I'm going to tell you, man, when you get the revelation that God is enough, then along with that comes that revelation that I'm not doing what I do and living my life trying to get God's love. He already loves me. 
And quite honestly, if I love him back or not, if I serve him or not, if I bow my knee and surrender to him or not, it does not change he, his, his love for me. I'm already loved. I'm already chosen. I know who I am and I know what you've spoken. Everybody that's in this room this morning, God has and continues to speak things over your life about who you are, what he plans to do in your life and what he plans to do through you. I'm already loved more than I can imagine and that is enough. We still communicating okay? Genesis. God had changed the man's name, changed his wife's name, promised to make him the father of many nations, told him, look at the stars, you'll have more kids than that. Look at the grains of sand, you'll have, your, 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 your generations will be more than that. Finally had that child after trying to go some other routes that we'll talk about in just one second. And then one day God said, hey, by the way, tomorrow I want you to take your son, and I want you to sacrifice. Oh, we act like God is asking us to give something up. I want you to take your son, your only son. The next day the Bible says, I'm paraphrasing, but this is what it says. You can read it later. Abraham saddled up his stuff and, and his son and, and, and he said to his servants, my son and I, are y'all here? My son and I are going to worship the Lord and my son and I will be back. And if you're new to this thing, man, or you're, you're, you're new to faith or, or, or whatever, I, I want to encourage you this morning. You see people make some bold declarations and immediately you think that person's something more than you. Can we have a lean-in moment? Because if you don't hear anything else, let's have a lean-in moment here. In 1 Kings, a guy shows up, Elisha the Tishbite. Nobody's ever heard of him. There's no record of him prior to this moment. The very first thing that you see, he shows up and says to the king, by the way, it's not going to rain again until I say so. Have a nice day. But I'm not really going to drop it because Mr. Larry will fuss at me. God knew the attacks that he would be under from the outside and from the inside. And at that very moment, he shielded him and he protected him. And he said, come with me, son. I've got a place I want you to go. And he sent him to the brook Cherith. And he sat him down by himself and miraculously fed him and miraculously watered him and kept him whole and built him up and strengthened him. That's what God does. How in the world can a man walk up to a king and say it ain't going to rain until I say so? But when you read in, in James chapter 5, particularly I encourage you to do this. Read the amplified version of the Bible. It says this about Elijah. He was just a man. He had emotions. He had a constitution or a makeup. He was no different than you. We look and see these people make these great faith declarations and we think, my God, if I could ever be like that. And what you don't know is the turmoil that exists on the inside of them. You might look at me if you know, now you don't know me that way. You might look at me and say, man, that guy, he's bold. He's got it all together. And what you don't know is the, the, what I go through on the inside. The times that I want to quit and the times that I feel like, man, I'm not worthy of this and I'm not smart enough and I'm not, I'm not blah, 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 blah. It ain't about you. He's enough. So how could the guy, and, and you know what happened? Lots of stuff in between. False prophets slaughtered God, responding with fire, all these miraculous things. Three and a half years later, it rained. Why? Because Elijah said, I hear a sound of the abundance of rain. Come on. Come on. And he sent his servant to check it out. How in the world can someone stand there and make such strong, bold declarations of faith? They must be at a place that I'm not at. No. They 
just trusted God and decided he's enough. I'm not playing the game anymore. I'm not pursuing the earthly. I'm not going after the American dream. Life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. I got in trouble years ago when I said, baby, God, I don't want you happy. God does not reward happiness. He rewards faithfulness. God does not pour his favor out on happiness. He pours his favor out on obedience. And I'm going to go a step further. I can be happy living in sin. Because happiness is a fleeting thing. I can be happy doing the wrong thing. I can't have joy. But I can be happy. But man, happiness rides this roller coaster, baby. And joy is... He's enough. Abram took his son up. His son willingly allowed himself to be affixed to the altar. Abraham went so far as to raise the knife. Are y'all seeing this? My God. And then he was told to stop. The angel of the Lord, stop, stop. A ram was in the thicket. Y'all know the story? That ram was sacrificed in place of Abraham's son. Here's what he said. I will call this place Jehovah Jireh. And to this day it is said on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. When we learn about God's name, Jehovah, I am Jireh, your provision. We see this story. The, the root word for the name Jireh literally means to see. Are you here? To see. The compound name when it's put together means to provide. So God is the God of visible provision or he's the God that sees ahead and provides. He's enough. But it goes deeper than that. Man, I remember in the 90s we were saying, Jehovah Jireh, my provider. And then we listen to some 30, 40, three-hour message about how we could all get rich. Oh, my God. <laughs> Abraham stood on a mountain, the child of promise right here in front of him, a knife right here, about to sacrifice the promise of God. And God stopped his hand. And he provided, and here's what he said, I will provide myself a sacrifice. Not I will provide a sacrifice for myself, I will provide myself Come on. a sacrifice. Abraham looked at the scene that played out before him. You know, we read the Bible, but sometimes we just read over some stuff. Romans says that it was accounted to Abraham that he was righteous. Although no man could be righteous before the, the birth and the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. But God went ahead and put it on his account that he was righteous. Why? Because he stood there on the mountain and he saw God lay out his plan of provision and redemption and salvation and reconciliation. He didn't blink an eye. But he said, I'm going to call this place Jehovah Jireh because I've seen God's plan. He's shown it to me. And he will continue to be a God that sees ahead and provides. He will continue to be a God that shows his plan. Are y'all here? My God, we almost done. I almost feel like a Pentecostal preacher. Yeah. All right, I do now. Oh, Lord. Last thing. He's enough. Somebody shout, he's enough. He's El Shaddai, the all sufficient one. He's Jehovah God, or the God of visible provision. Here's one you may not have heard too much. We're talking about 
Abraham. How many of you ever read the Bible, first of all? I'm not a paid endorser, but I highly recommend it. <laughs> Do you read your Bible sometimes and you stop and you go, what? Do you scratch your head and say, uh, Lord, you're going to have to explain it to me. Abraham and, and Sarah, they had this promise from God, man, of, uh, of what he was going to do and, and this child of promise. And it, it, it just, it was slow in coming. How many of you here this morning have a promise from God that's been slow in coming? I got a promise from God. It's in his word and it's been spoken over me about 17,436 times. Since 1993 or 4. To the point, you may feel this is bad. Can I just be honest this morning? To the point that some people have come up and said, Brother, I want to share, and I've just stopped them. So I know what you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you what you're going to say. That's right, brother. And I'm like, God bless you. Thank you so much. And I go to Christy and I say, Man, their heart's so good. They're so excited that God used them to share that word with me. And they don't know I've heard it 17,000 times. You said I could be real. To the point that I said, God, don't send anybody else to tell me that. <laughs> Either do it or don't, but quit sending people to tell me. Sarah had a plan. I mean, no man's plans are never good in comparison to God's. <clears throat> she said, this thing ain't working, man, but, you know, we, I'm going to fix it. She said, I got this servant girl over here, Hagar. First of all, that's the one where I stopped and said, God, what wife in the world giving her husband a younger, better-looking woman? That makes no sense. <laughs> right there alone was enough for me to say, God, you're going to teach me something. I don't understand any of this. <laughs> and some of the translations say he took her as his wife. So she's not just a concubine or whatever. She, she is also a wife. She gets pregnant. Sarah had been trying all these years. She really way too old to have a baby. And now her, her plan was to put them together for this purpose. But now that Hagar has this baby, she kind of holding it over Sarah. And there's contention between them. Shocking. Just watch Sister Wise. You'll figure that out. Sarah goes to Abraham and said, you're you going to have to send her away. Abraham's just shaking his head. All I did was what she said, Lord. <laughs> How many men out of their mouth that said, all I did is what my wife told me. Now she's changed her mind. <laughs> See, Christy wasn't with me today, so I'm good. <laughs> um, he told her, do what you want to. She was sent away. As she was wandering, as she was hurt, as she was feeling rejected, having done nothing wrong, she'd done exactly what she was instructed to do. The Lord spoke to her and said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back. And I want you to submit to Sarah. If you ain't ever heard a hard word from the Lord, odds are you ain't ever heard a word from the Lord. So I can't tell you how many times out of my mouth I've said, you want me to do what? But God, I, when I, I didn't do it. It's not my fault. I mean, no, God ain't counting whose fault it is or not. He's just a God of peace and reconciliation. Your Bible doesn't say blessed are the peacekeepers. It says blessed are the peacemakers. 
if two people are in a situation and one of them doesn't carry peace, then they ain't going to be able to make peace. That means you, with the Prince of Peace alive inside you through the person of the Holy Spirit, you got to go make peace, even if it means taking fault when you were faultless, even if it means accepting responsibility when you are not responsible. There was this guy once that hung on a cross. For the sin of mankind, which he was not responsible for any of it. But instead of begging off, he said, God, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. That's why he's enough. He is enough. Genesis 16, 13 Hagar gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her, Jehovah, or Elroy, I'm sorry, Elroy, you are the God who sees me. I have now seen the one who sees me. Why did I finish up with that? Because I want you to understand something. Let's lean in for a minute. We'll be out here in just a moment. He sees you. He sees you. I can't right now because I don't have my glasses on, but he sees you. <laughs> I can see the front row blurry and that's it. The rest of you are just blobs and forms. He sees you. He's enough. He's the God of all sufficiency. The God of more than enough. He's the God of visible provision. And he's the God who sees you. I don't know where you're at right now in your life. Some of you I do. Most of you, I really don't. But I want to encourage you. The games that we've played for so many years. The heaven church that we've done for so many years. First of all, the church ain't a building. You can't go there. Amen, Pastor. And it's not an event Amen again, Pastor. The church is the body of Christ. That means it does you and I no good to act all spiritual this morning and act all like a fool at work tomorrow. It's time to lay all that nonsense down. There's nothing that this world has to offer it's worth compromising the spirit of God that's alive inside of you. He wants to speak to you. He wants to make his word come alive. He wants to speak prophetically to you. He wants to sing over you. He wants to heal you. He wants to restore you and he wants to reconcile you. And he will. Our role is what? Our response just surrender and say, do it, Lord. Have your way in me because you are enough. Stop looking to your boss or your, employee, your co-workers to validate you. It's not their job. And they don't have the authority to do it. Stop looking to this world's system to justify your actions. This world system is corrupt. And, and let me say this, and it feels out of left field, so somebody needs to hear it. Something being legal sure don't make it right. And in our hearts, we know what's right and wrong. Because God has placed that knowledge in us. There was a time when we only knew good. But Satan deceived Eve and she turned to her husband who was there with her and they ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that God said, you must not eat of. And Satan said, I really don't want you to eat of it because he knows when you eat of it, you'll, you'll be just like him. And to a point, that was true. Prior to that, they only had knowledge of good. Thank God for when we're finally in heaven for all eternity because there will only be good. So there'll be no reason for knowledge of anything but 
good. It'll be like a return to the Garden of Eden. But we got a knowledge of both now. He is enough. He's enough to heal you. He's enough to transform you. He's enough to inspire you. He's enough to keep you going. He's enough to fill every place of emptiness that exists in you. He is enough. Surrender your heart to him today. Did you get anything out of this? Amen. Thank you for letting me come over here today. Father, we love you so much this morning. <laughs> but we know you love us so much more. God, you're enough. <clears throat> Stir our hearts this morning, God, to quit looking for, to other sources for validation, to quit looking to other sources for peace, to quit looking to other sources for joy when only you can provide those things. Settle down on us at this moment, Holy Spirit. We're praying it right now and declaring it be so that your peace just settles down on us. Peace like a river. Peace of God that passeth all understanding. Peace of God, settle on us in Jesus' name. Settle on us, settle on us. Settle on us, peace of God. Where we've been running to and fro and bouncing off walls because we don't know where to go or what to do, we're just declaring in Jesus' name. Peace of God, settle on us. Hmm. I feel it. Thank you, Father, for everything you've done in this place today. God, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.